Whoa, whoa, whoa. She's waking us up. <laughs> you and me. I wonder if we need to connect to something. No, I don't need that. Oh, how was the hike? It's a lot of fun. The scenery, I think, what I impresses me always the scenery. Always in the open office. So today we're going to learn all about quantum friction. Yeah. Both experiment and theory. But the uh, first theory. But uh, um, we have a special uh, Preview, you've got the email from Jack Lee, like, make sure you make it. Um, and hopefully, you all have fun. So, without further ado, I think I will give the floor to Ronnie, who use the board, I think. No. Luckily, I was the last speaker yesterday and the first one today, so I still have, I didn't have to work on the board too much. So we had the idea, and the idea about quantum friction is none of the abatic dynamics. So our Hamiltonian, if you think about the driven system, shouldn't commute with itself at different times. Otherwise, we stay in the energy, which I call the energy shell all the time, and we're in the abatic. If we start, if you start the thermal, you're a function of energy, you stay there. So this is an interesting case. And before I go, and I'll do it on spin. But before I do it on spin, I'll do this, I'll do a cartoon. I'll draw what happens for the harmonic oscillator. It's just to get the understanding. And this is what I started yesterday. You start, I started in that order with you change the frequency of your oscillator. So why isn't it that you with your Hamiltonian in that again? So kinetic energy doesn't commute with potential energy. This is typical. When we're our control, which in this case is the potential energy, doesn't commute with the total Hamiltonian. So this is typical when we drive. We don't have control of everything. If we could control simultaneously the mass and the potential, we could stand energy shift. 
but we can't. So in this case, if we want to change the potential pass, we get to the situation the Hamiltonian doesn't commute with itself a different pass. Okay, so now we can think about it. So let's draw it in base space. So I have an equilibrium state with certain frequency. An equilibrium looks like looks like a Gaussian. And it's centered at the origin, and it looks like a Gaussian. And then I expand my region. What happened to you? Ah, okay, good for that. So then I open my trap. So what happened? We immediately see if I do it fast, my like here I did it extreme, I did sudden, so I moved. My state didn't change in this picture, but I opened my trap. So now I have a new definition of phase space. And what I get is a squeeze state. So in this case, I squeezed in position. So you get it like that. So a squeeze state like that starts to rotate with a frequency twice omega, but this is what I got. So I got coherence. Squeeze state has coherence because it's non-stationary. So what do I do next? So here I did, I did a diabetic. We call it diabetic expansion, but I did it non adiabatic either, which here. Now I do thermalization. What does thermalization do? Reduce it to a thermal state, and the thermal state again is wrong. So you reached here. Now, because I invested, you can say work, to squeeze, when I thermalize, I lost, I did dephasing. This is what happened. So I got it like that. This is what the meaning of dephasing. I lost all phase because it says in, the state is invariant dynamics, but I got to a hotter state that if I would do it, you could say adiabatically, I would I would get a colder state. I would be here. I would get a colder state here. So <clears throat> When I and typically when I expand, my state should be hot or cold. What do you think? When I do a diabetic expansion, what happens to the temperature? It's down. So this should be the okay, same scale should be more concentrated than this, but I get something that's hot. And then I can do the opposite. I go from here, I want to go get the low frequency to hot frequency. So I started like that and I end like that. So now I squeezed it in this direction. So again, I'm squeezing. I, gen I put work into coherence. I got a non-stationary state. And when I thermalize this in the cold path, again, I lose this you can say this kind of work that I invested, and that's friction. So if I want to draw my auto cycle, this would be the frequency. So normally we solve the auto cycle, this let's say would be for harmonic oscillator there. And it would look like that, it would look like a square. This is low frequency, this is the cold side. On the C, this is a hot side, H. And if you do an engine, you do the cycle like that. So this would be, you can say, the quasi stop. Okay, go here and isotherms look like that. But now what I'm doing, you can say if I started, I started here, which is what they did here, I went here, I found myself with a higher occupation. So I found myself here. Now I'm going to cool in the cold bath, but if I'll cool up to, let's say, 
this point here, this point here. Then when I'll go again, I won't find myself here. I'll find myself here. So this would be the new cycle. Mm -hmm. So you can say all this, I have to cool more and I absorb less heat from the hot bed. So my engine is less efficient. This would be the hot side. So my engine is less efficient. I get less heat from here and I have to dissipate more energy. So if I want my car to go fast, I need a big radiator. This is what it means from the point of view of the auto side. So at least what I showed you here is the intuition why non-adiabatic dynamics leads to friction-like behavior. And it behaves like friction in the sense that it's proportional to the non-adiabatic at the parameter, which I'll show you in a minute. So you go faster, you pay more. This is the general rule about the friction. Okay, so I gave you a phase space picture for the harmonic oscillator, but you can do similar things with output for a cheap. So I have to introduce a Hamiltonian that has this property. So my Hamiltonian would be omega sigma z plus epsilon sigma z. And these are functions of time. So I'm driving my system. So you can say on the Bloch sphere, I'm changing the direction of the Hamiltonian through some trajectory that I choose. So omega and epsilon are my protocols on how I'm going to change them in time. You could say, okay, I can keep this constant and only play with this, or you can uh, change both. So now, <clears throat> now I need basically a language that we can do this analysis. And the language that I want to use is Louisville space or Hilbert space of operators. So as I said, what do we need for Hilbert space of operators? We need a scalar product. So as I said, A, B is a trace A dagger B. So that S, all the properties of a scalar product. So I can do Hilbert space for operators. They have to be bounded, but if we're talking about discrete systems or what's called C-step algebra, we have that. And then I need another property. And the other property is, I, in order to do, you can say dynamics in closed forms, I need a Lie algebra. So a Lie algebra is a set of operators that the transmission relation so this is in a way all what I need from from the algebra that there's I have a set of operators that are set of commutators close and for my spin cases would be the SU2 algebra. So you could generalize what I'm doing to SU2, but you could use other algebras, harmonic oscillator, Heisenberg Weyl algebra, but whatever. So this is the, the property that I'm using. I have cool closed commutation relation. What it means, and this is in a way of theory, if I have a situation like that and my Hamiltonian. It's also composed of operators, let's say HJ and AJ. Then Heisenberg equations of motion are closed to this algebra. So all what I need to describe my dynamics is only operators inside the algebra. So I can switch, which I'm going to do to Heisenberg representation, which is more intuitive because immediately I can read out of Heisenberg representation my observables. This is the one reason to do that. 
Well, if you want to want to have a homophony that's constructed of the algebra, then it's closed. So in our case, we need <coughs> one more operator. We have x, y, z. That's composed three operators composed of SU2 algebra plus the identity. And their commentators are closed. <coughs> okay, so this is one part that I need. And the other part that I need is how to describe my density. So now this is an operator algebra. So what's the size of my algebra for? Just because it's a two by two matrix. So I need, since identities, I have it always. So I need the identity and three numbers to describe my state complete. So it would be half the identity, reserve normalization, and three traces operators. <coughs> So this is a complete description of my dynamics, so I can solve if I want to work in the Schrodinger picture, so I solve for these three, three parameters, but I also can observe that if I take the example, for example, sigma x, And I use this rule of scalar product. So you take the trace, let's say the trace. So the trace, the all our traces, so the trace of this would be zero. Now I'll get sigma x squared plus the trace of sigma x squared. That's the identity that will give me two, right? So if I take this, this would give me two alpha. And this sigma x times sigma y would be z. Again, traceless and sigma z times sigma x would give me y. Again, traces, so I'm left with this. So if I look at that, so alpha is expectation value of sigma x divided. So I can solve Heisenberg, and I immediately can get can reconstruct my state. And this is geometrically what we understand as the block sphere. So this is what I'm going to use. So I'm going to work in Heisenberg. And you can say this is one possible possibility to write my density operator, but I don't want this one. I want another one because my Hamiltonian is explicitly time dependent. So I want to use what I call thermodynamically observable, thermodynamic observable. So what observable we have in thermodynamics? Energy. So I want to use a set of operators that's based on the Hamiltonian. So that's one. And I need two more. So I need three operators to and describe my open space, and I want them to be orthogonal. So this is what I want. So, oh, oh, I don't have to normalize them, but I want them to be orthogonal. So I'm going to start a set of operators that I will use for my dynamics. So So I have H, as I said, it's omega and then I'll have L, which is I need the normalization. Omega is my value for this. Oops. 
So now I let you check that this is an orthogonal a set of operators. So it's legitimate to describe any state, including my density operator, with a set of operators. And since they're orthogonal, it means, okay, they're good. <clears throat> so it means each one has a meaning. So this is what we, I call the Hamiltonian. This is the Lagrangian, and this is a, you say, a correlator. So the names come, if you do the same trick for harmonic oscillators, then you can get this uh, standard mean that L is the, what becomes a Lagrangian. Okay, so now what I can do. I can write my density operator again half i plus We don't have a normalization here. Yeah. So I have a normalization here. Two divided by omega squared by half So now, if you want, I do three measurements on an ensemble. I get the average energy, the Lagrangian, and the Correlator, and I set. I know my state. <clears throat> so now, immediately you can see these operators don't commute. They form the same F, their basis by the same SU two algebra. So they're in, in the set here. So <clears throat> now I can go on and then decide. Okay, I want to uh, solve my uh, equations of motion when my Hamiltonian is explicitly time dependent. So I have a protocol that changes in omega, changes omega and changes epsilon. Okay, now, okay, just the pause. This I, I put as a homework problem from uh, yesterday, just so you will have some fun. This is to derive a master equation for a scattering case if you set this Poissonian master equation, the rate of collisions, the S matrix, and it's explicitly solvable. I don't know to say how much time it takes. If my Hamiltonian is again qubit, my path is composed of qubits. And they're in thermal equilibrium. So when I have a bath of qubits colliding with my qubit, it thermalizes it to be solved. And then we we'll say there are two cases. So one is a swap case. That this operator that you have in the S major is a swap with a certain angle. And you can do either the angle is small and span to second order, or the angle is pi over two, which would be a different swap. So in both cases you can solve it straight in straightforward way. In case number two, this operator G is tensor product between sigma C of my system and sigma C of my of my path. And again. You can check that this G always is obeys uh, strict energy conservation. And you can solve it and get the master equation with the GKL exponent. So that's, I put this in your home. So now I'm going back to my set of operations. Now I want to solve Heisenberg equations of Hamilton for this set. And if I do that, I can get all observable about. So how do I do that? Here, you can I can operator is 
plus I H operator, but it's explicitly time dependent. So I have to add the explicit time dependent to that. Since my basis is explicitly time dependent, as we said before, I'm following the state with its energies of primary friction. So I have that. So now we need equations of motion for my set. And there are a couple. So what do you say should be on the diagonal of this, this term? It should always be zero. The part of it is all in the traces. The diagonal is always zero. And then, in order to do that, you have to work off the commutator and take the explicit time dependence, and you can check. So, if I take the explicit time dependence here, what do I get? That's for H. H. Plus H of B on the top is the Z plus F on the top. And it commutes with itself, right? Okay, so now I have to uh, I have to change these operators back to basically project these operators sigma x sigma z back to my original basis set, and I'll be lazy. I'll do that for you. And you get here. You, you can see it. This is a linear combination. Has to be because I have X and Z, so it has to be a linear combination of H and H and L. But I can put it as I said that this has to be zero, so this is like this. so I have here a mu, here another minus mu of L by mu and this. This has to be anti condition. So I have it. And now you can do the same thing for C and I'll put here one. Then what I did tell you what is mu? Mu is the diabetic parameter. It's epsilon dot omega. That's epsilon divided by the Robin frequency. Q. So let's check. Yep, yeah, this is fine. It's dimension. It's a dimensionless property, which tells us how about my something about my driving. How far am I away from? You could say non-adiabatic. You could call it the non-adiabatic parameter and the adiabatic parameter, and the weight has the same. Mean. So I I get. You can see a very simple equation of motion in this form. And you can see when mu is equal to zero, which is the diabetic case, H separates. Oh, I forgot this. Again, for the normalization, one over omega q. Yeah. Everything here is multiplied. So you can 
can see when you can see zero, all what I get, you can say I get oscillations between L and C. So we're talking about basically coherence is oscillating. So I didn't define yet coherence, but now we can do that. So in the geometric case, what we should get, like we was just oscillation of the coherence. And H doesn't change. The dynamic geometric, you can say H couples to L and L couples to C, and the whole system becomes coupled, and we get non geometric So <clears throat> We can check that this is dimensionless because here I have one over time and omega g has dimensions of frequency. So altogether, this is a dimensionless quantity and you can define similar things for harmonic oscillator, I'll just write it, it's simpler there. I change my frequency in harmonic oscillator, it was like that. So that's you can say a general thing. And now I have I want to define my coherence. So coherence is everything that's not energy, right? So maybe I'll put it here. So coherence we can define as up to normalization L square C square. Right, I'll check myself so I won't mislead you. Yeah, one over omega, so that's right. Okay, so cook. So, what's the rational? These two operators are orthogonal to the Hamiltonian, so they describe something else. So, we lump them together. We take their expectation value. We take the square root that defines the amount of coherence that we can, can produce here. And the other point that now comes to the idea of this algebra, each algebra has a Casimir. So we heard about a Casimir, but this is not the same Casimir. And the Casimir is the operator which is invariant under the Hamilton. So it's not, doesn't change. And this has, means that it has nice properties with the Casimir of G for SU2. You could say, I could write with sigma x squared, it's basically the radius of the flow sphere. But I could also write it as one over omega squared, H squared. L squared with C squared. So this is the same type. So this is a constant of motion. So now we can see that if I started only with energy, so my cousin then was basically the square of the energy. And now I do some dynamics, not that get back. So I generate coherence. So you could see that would become if I generate coherence, and this is has to be constant, it means that I have to increase decrease my energy, which in in this case means that I invest more work to the, the negative side of the motion. So this is you can say out of this idea that we have a constant, which is a Casimir, who's also in too much dynamics, we can understand it. But here I have dynamics that I can solve. And why can I solve this? Here I have a simple matrix uh, equation. So when can I solve this? When I can diagonalize this. When can I diagonalize a matrix if it's time independent? So what I have to do in order to solve it, I can assume that U is constant. So I run at a block of code that has constant at your back speed. And you can see there is, where is my definition? Of the, 
This tells me how to run this protocol. So I can change epsilon and, and omega in such a way that mu becomes constant. So it doesn't mean I'm doing things slow. I can do things extremely fast, but I run them under a protocol that's constant that it happens. So if I do that, this matrix becomes constant. I can diagonalize it and I can get the propagator just by diagonalizing in a typical way that you get the problem. So I'll show you the result in the Now, <clears throat> this type of behavior is what's called inertial. So I run not on a, a diabetic protocol, under an inertial protocol. So I run under a constant speed. So it's an, it means a certain type of protocol. So it's inertial. And what does it mean? That I separated the time scale out. The fast time scale is here. I can change omega, my hobby frequency as fast as I want. But I took it out. This part is constant. So I was able to, to do a separation of time scale between the fast time, which tells me I'm very non adaptive and you can see a slower dynamics in this time-dependent basis that I use. So this is a general idea you can use that to solve. You can say master equation, you can use other things, you could use that. Okay, so I have here an equation of motion, which I can solve it. And then, not to bore you, I wrote the book. Here, here. This is the solution. That would be HLC by T. And zero. And there's an additional, you can say, scaling by, by the frequency. Time to identity. So it's just a scaling of everything. When, if I'm changing my, my omega, I'm changing the energy scale. So this is a trivial scaling, which that's why it comes to identity. And this is the dynamics. So here's the solution. I can do it explicitly. And what you see is typical, it's the periodic. The C is cosine, S is sine. I have mu square here, and you can check again if mu is zero, basically all, all this falls out and the Hamiltonian separates from the rest. Otherwise, you can say everything makes itself, but still, it's an explicit solution. And what's the time scale of the periodicity is the integral of the Hobby frequency over time. So this is the amount of phase you accumulate in this type of data. So the period is determined by this phase. And this is the, the solution that, that you can see. So, and is there a difference in the dynamics qualitatively if omega dot is zero versus epsilon dot t? They're symmetric here. Okay. Symmetry of the block sphere it doesn't matter. If I make it asymmetric, so, so if I said. No, so you can, then, you, can, yeah. you can have a protocol that you only change one, and the other stays constant. If you keep, if you keep mu, which is not here, here if you keep. All I got to do is this is this protocol. And people try this experimental experiment. It's been done. It follows this protocol and it shows it follows, which is not surprising from my point of view, because it's the, you get this exact. Now, just if, if you ask about that, it's a little bit more subtle because it behaves like an adiabatic protocol. So it's immune to noise. So inertial protocols are stable. So they have a, a, this additional property like a diabetic protocol, that even if you have noise, they, you can say the noise only influences the amplitude, not the phase, which is this property of 
this type of portal. You could say in control it will have certain or certain advantages if you can do it means let's say for stir up, you don't have to do a slow, okay, a better portal. You can do a fast one if you follow the initial portal. Okay. So now we can see that when mu is small, you can get a certain correction to the energy that you get here, or you can say mu is small. So you can suppose that the not the none of the better parameters square, that's their correction. That's and you can say that the correction comes exactly as we said before. That's the amount of friction or coherence that you produce when in this. But then this is what it is. And then when you look at this solution, I have it's very odd. So not why not look for it's period. So I can look for cases when, let's say I do a full cycle when this cosine starts from one, goes back to one. Here you see this one over mu square cancels with this k, see one over mu square. So I go back, if you think if mu is, if, if the cosine is one, I get them this matrix one. So the Hamiltonian is not coupled to anything. I recover my adiabatic solution. So I can look for cases when the C is one. So it means I can accumulate amount of phase that will give me back, you can say two pi. And I'll reach to a solution that again, energy doesn't couple to the rest. How do we call to the, these types of solutions? They're term shortcuts to a diabetes. Because I'm not following the diabetic protocol. In the middle, I have coherence. So I generate coherence, and then I cash on it and go back to where I start. So I can do my motion by choosing a certain protocol. At a certain time, I go back, since the solution is periodic, I get back where it started from, so I can do, let's say this adiabatic expansion, adiabatically using what's called shortcut to adiabatics. And this term has been coined by Muga Gonzalez, and you can find it in the literature in different ways. So I showed you a certain solution of this, let's say, spin problem that you can do that. But that's only one possibility. You get what's called the shortcut, and you can see there are infinitely many solutions when I accumulate the phase of two time, I go back, so you get these periodic solutions. So if you want to run your engine, you can choose your protocol in such a way that you'll cancel, you can say, the coherence that's generated on the, you can say, on the unitary limits, and then you're back to the square auto cycle where we start. For an auto cycle, this is possible to do because we separated, you can see that the adaptive part from the thermalization. So by choosing this type of protocol shortcut to a diplomacy, you can do that. Now, what's the price? In a way, there's no price, but this is like a catalyst. I have to invest in coherence in the, in the, on the way. And I cash it back. So, from the point of view, if I think about the controller, my controller has an energy. It puts this energy into my system and can, then sucks it back. So, if my controller is perfect, then it's fine. All what I put in, I get back. So, you can think about it. If I have a crane that lifts a weight, if I paper that it lifts, you can lift the weight. But when the, if it goes down, if I put a generator on it, in principle, I can recover part of my investment. Typically, what happens, you throw it in. But that's like the London Underground. When they break, they use the electricity back. But still, if you go to the London tube, it's quite hot from the friction of the trains of tube here and there. So not everything is recovered. You can say from the point of view of the system alone, 
these shortcuts for the publicity, they recover at the price that you temporarily invest into the energy into your system. Okay. So now we have a solution for the dynamics. For this is free dynamics. So now we want to make progress on this. And we say, okay, my, my point was I want to do the Carnot engine. In the Carnot engine, what do I do? I change my Hamiltonian simultaneously with coupling to the heat depth. So what did I tell you yesterday? That we have to modify our master equation. Our master equation has to follow the dynamics. It can't be the same master equation if I change my Hamiltonian. So in, in a way, how do you do that? In this case, we solved half the problem because I solved the dynamics of the free, the free dynamics. This is what I have. So if I use the same protocol for driving, I can use this also to obtain my master equation. So because then I have the free dynamics. And as I said, the free dynamics should commute with the dissipative dynamics. So I can construct a master equation that now is explicitly time dependent. And <clears throat> we call it, we have a nice name for it. It's called name, non-adiabatic master equation. So So this is the next step that I'm going to do. So when you think about a master equation, we said we have an invariant, that's a thermal state, but now we're driving it. So we, we don't have an invariant, or we, in a simple case, because we, everything is time dependent. So instead of an invariant, we have a fixed point. If it's a temporary fixed point, so, it's an operator. Let's see. But this is time dependent. So this is a time dependent. So I have what I would call time dependent attractor. When my system tries to go there, that I move the car. So in this case, Up on organization. So, where is the two? Okay, that doesn't matter. Let's cut that one. So, this is going to be my attractor. So you can see since H changes in time, and this also changes in time because C is proportional to omega. So this is explicitly time kind of different. So again, when U equals zero, it falls back. So my tractor is the Hamilton. So I fall back to that. And in a way, once I know that tractor, I know everything else. Because at least in a two level system, what do I need in order to describe my master equation? I need a complete basis. So, what I need to find is orthogonal operators to 
my attractor. So we can describe them as usual with sigma and their time dependent. And omega minus three H minus I kappa help us. So, the way to think about I have a moving target and I have a mo moving coordinate system. So, my moving coordinate system follows the Hamiltonian, but in this case, it's a driven system, so it follows the track. So, this is going to be my, you can say, one coordinate. And I have sigma and sigma plus because I have an I here, and they are the jump operators in this case. So they do the excitations in this rotating frame. So now my master equation will you say the dissipated part that will be just the half sigma plus sigma minus now it's Heisenberg. And same thing. This is K up, K down. Same. And here it's sigma minus. Plus minus half then. Okay. And I'm left with my detailed balance. So the question is what's the detailed balance here? So I'm coupled to a thermal path, but I'm driving my system. So the question you should ask, okay, what does my bat see when it looks at my system? Because my bat is going to try to equilibrate, but it sees a moving target. So you could say I should use the adiabatic approximation. And then I would say detailed balance should be with, with respect to the Rabi frequency to omega. But that's not correct. There's a modification here. Since I'm driving the system, the detailed balance is normalized to, you could say, to the diabetic, to the non diabetic parameter. And to a modified frequency, which I'll write here. Frequency which I call alpha of t, alpha of t is normalized by one plus mu squared. So, what do I see? That the bath sees a higher, when I drive my system at least a few bit, the draft, the bath sees a higher effective frequency by mu squared. This is the normalization. And you could ask if this is general. No. If you do the same thing for the harmonic oscillator, the bath sees a lower frequency, not a higher frequency. This is, depends on the algebra. So this is count algebra solution. You can say that okay, this is a modified thing. Okay, so what did we achieve? We used you can see the, the tools that we can solve explicitly the dynamics, the free dynamics. We use the free dynamics to construct the master equation. So now we're set. We have a master equation of a driven qubit 
according to a, a certain protocol. Now, you could use it in a more general way. Why? Because I could say, okay, I can use this protocol piecewise. I can say if I change mu slowly, it's like doing the diabetic following. So I can use this protocol also behind, I don't have to be strict about it. I can say, okay, turn on and I can turn, if, if I don't change mu too fast, I can use this protocol and I can ask, you could say the question, I have my engine. I want to accelerate my equilibration. I want to make my engine as fast as possible. So I want to thermalize as fast as possible. So I have the freedom to choose a protocol. And then you ask, <clears throat> how do I accelerate or deaccelerate my thermalization? So to deaccelerate, we know if I do it at the abatically very slowly, I'll switch equilibrium. I'll be very efficient doing that, and I get you could say the reversible result. And I'll get if I do it for a qubit, I'll get a coronal result. So this is one limit. But now I want to do things as fast as possible. And the question is, what's our how? What's our intuition? How would you do that? So I would say the trivial or not trivial you could say the first choice would be a quench in my engine i'm changing from omega c to omega h or from omega h to omega c so how should i operate the engine it's in a sudden limit i'll switch my frequency from one to a, to the other and i'll wait for equilibration so this is a possible solution and what do we know about it Eventually, in the beginning, it will be fast. Eventually, it will crawl the solution. So it's not really a good solution. So the question is, can we do better? And the answer is, you can say, this is what I call the Mapemba effect. And uh, the Mapemba effect, I'll tell you the story, so we'll, we'll wait for it. He was a popsicle a seller in Tanzania. And he was selling popsicles at the beach. And he found out that if he starts to, he has a freezer, he starts from hot water, he makes his popsicles fast. And this is called the Matemba effect. And it's, you don't believe that, right? You think if I start cold, it should go fast. So since I don't believe it, I took my grandson and we did this test at home with liquid nitrogen. So I really, because he doesn't have much patience. So, so with liquid nitrogen, it takes one minute about to freeze something and it works. So the Matemba effect is real. At least I tested it. You can believe me or not. But for water, it's not easy to understand why. But for, in this case, we can understand why. How can we accelerate equilibration? This is the issue here. So what do we know? If we think just very generally, we know that the rate of heat transport is what we need, goes as a distance from equilibrium. That's linear response in general, but we know that's true. So if I want to pull fast, that's a typical question you ask folks. You should put the milk first to the hot coffee or later. We want to cool our coffee, so we put the milk later, right? We want to cool fast when the difference with temperature is large, and then we add the milk later. So this is the same case. If we want to really be as fast as possible to equilibrate, we want to be as far as possible from equilibrium all the time. Now, when we do a quench, initially we're far from equilibrium, but then when we reach the final state, we're very slow. So this is not good. So what can we do? Now we have quantum mechanics. This is what helps us to do that. Because if I generate coherence, I'm always far from equilibrium. Coherence, by definition, equilibrium state doesn't have coherence. So you can say, how do I build a protocol? I take my system, I generate coherence. I'm far from equilibrium. I'm going to relax fast, but then I can rotate back, 
cache on my coherence and go back to the energy. So if I do that, I can accelerate my thermalization, but I pay the price because I generate coherence and I dissipate coherence. So to accelerate will cost me work, but I can get to equilibrium much faster. So this is called shortcuts to equilibrium. And I'll draw you up. How this should look, how a possible equilibrium. Here is time. And let's say I'm allowing myself to change omega. And here I have omega C, and here I have omega H. So I want to go from here, let's say, to here. So I start at here, and I want to end here at a certain time. Oh, so how would different protocols look like? Quench, I immediately go to here and go to here. And then I'll crawl in this section here, I'll crawl on this At the back there will be something here. But what do we do? I go from high, I do this. I, go low, I understand much as possible. So I take my frequency, I go below the target, and I do it fast. So I generate coherence on the way because I'm non adiabatic as I said, my mu is not zero. And then I choose my protocol in such a way that the, the target time that I choose I cache on all the coherence, so I'm back at the thermal state. So I did a shortcut. I started from thermal, I ended thermal, but I accelerated. What's the price? Work. I did more work. So if I do it in this direction, it would look like that. And if I switch here, this is H. So if I want to do the opposite, I start here. And end here. I'm going to overshoot. So overshooting is easier. I really can push up the height, the frequency. The undershoot is I'm limited by zero frequency. This I can do in an easy way. So in a way I can accelerate significantly my equilibrium. And since all the time here I have coherence, I'm far from equilibrium all the time. So I do it in a fast rate, and eventually I reach my target, and I do a pay a price. What's the price? Entropy generation in the back. Extra en entropy generation be beyond, you could say, the adiabatic limit, which would be zero entropy if I do it adiabatic. So this is what you would say the story of the Mapemba effect. How much time do I have? What? Infinite. You, you ask me, I'll say infinite. Maybe another five minutes. Okay, so five, that's makes it sufficient but because I want to kind of conclude because I, I promised to talk about engines I did in the beginning I gave you the inner parts so I gave you the let's say the unitary part the dissipated part of an engine but we didn't assemble an engine off the back so we have to close the cycle right so as I said the cycle propagator is a product, say, of a unitary part 
cycle so I can start let's say from H I go from H to C C C to H so now we have all the ingredients because we saw for the individual propagators of each segment or stroke that we have in our cycle. And we have, we can concatenate this like we do in a quantum cycle. We're going to get the cycle operator. And once we get the cycle propagator, we can look for its fixed point and calculate what we need efficiency, statistics, everything can be calculated out of this. And as I said before, these things don't commute. Each cycle propagator doesn't commute. The unitary part, and you can say the thermal part, the unitary part don't commute. Otherwise, this, this wouldn't work. And you can solve it. So there's certain limit. There is a limit, the reversible limit. There is sudden limit and other limits. But I want to go to something in quantum here, because we, we're in a quantum thermodynamics. So when you look at that, it doesn't look too quantum. I told you, if you take my car engine, it also will look like that, and the, these propagators won't commute. And if you want to know the reason, you can say that the unitary part is classical, translated into permutation, and thermalization doesn't commute with permutation, even in the can say stochastic master equation. So you can say if you only think about probabilities, also this they will commute. But now we're in the quantum regime. Everything is quantum. We have coherence. We have everything. So we have two time scales, or maybe maybe more. But let's say basically two. We have individual time scale that I put here. And they are typically defined by my Rabi frequency. So you could say 2 pi over the Rabi frequency gives the time scale that happens here. Why is this a good time scale? This gives, if you think about how much phase they accumulate, that's a phase of one. So these are the internal time scales. And then I have a cycle time scale, which is the overall time that takes to do the whole thing. So you would think that I would do a few Rabi cycles here, a few Rabi cycles here. And when you would do that, you would get results that if I will just show you them, will resemble what you would get from, you can say a stochastic engine. You wouldn't see, the coherence would be there, but you won't see it. You could say, if I do a shortcut, I got rid of the coherence. So it's hidden, but it's hidden in friction and other things, but you look at the cycle, it looks like my steam engine. So we have the cycle time scale and the internal one. Okay, so what happens when I start to shorten my time scale? The cycle. And this becomes comparable. So no, everything collapses. I can't really differentiate between coherence and energy and everything. Everything collapses because there's no time. I can't do a full Rabi cycle, so I can't do shortcuts. I can't do anything. And then you can do a very simple idea. And you can say that each of these propagators, I can write as, you can say, LH. I could write it like that. But now I take this time to be very short. 
relative to what? To the action that they produce here. So you could say energy times time, this is ash. So if each stroke has small action relative to H bar, this is the quantum limit. So my action here is small, here is small, here is small, here is small. So what can I do? This is a throttle formula. We all know what this means. I can run it. I can say it's L, L H, L C. approximately like that. So what did I get? Continuous engine. I can't, I did, I don't have to now separate it into different strokes. I got from the discrete limit, in the limit of small action, I reached to the limit of continuous engine on the one hand. And then you can see another phenomenon that the mechanism of extracting work changes before I extracted work from population. And in this case, when I go to this limit, I extract work out of the coherence. So there's, you can say, a, a change from, you can say, long cycle time to short cycle times where you reach this quantum effect. And how do you know it's quantum? Because it, it, as I said, it's based on coherence. If I put dephasing, the engine will die. If I can add dephasing to my equations, you'll see I'll get nothing. So this is, you can say, the test that my engine reached its quantum limit. It works on coherence. And if I kill the coherence, the engine doesn't work anymore. So this has been tested experimentally in an NV center. It's hard to, from, if you read the experiment, it's not so easy to see how this is done because the trouble about the, this experiment, the, the, the baths are not easy to imagine. It's not, the, the, the difficult is really how do you simulate the hot and cold bath in this type of experiment. But it generally follows this idea how to go from a discrete case to a continuous case. And I think at this point here, if I won't stop, Hussein will no, no, hit me. Yeah. Okay, so I'll stop here. And Thank you. A quick question first. Uh, so the non-commuting terms in this are suppressed by T squared, with T being small, we can explain that. Right? We're here. Uh, going from that to the next. Yeah. Term. So that way you need small action. Okay. And uh, a more general question. So we've been talking about all these protocols and using coherences to obtain friction and uh, can we do something similar with entanglement and what would has that been done okay in principle first of all it hasn't been done in, in the way you're talking about in principle entanglement is coherence True. yeah so it should work mm -hmm. now you could i would say this it hasn't been done as i know but you could say I can do an SU2, not on a spin, not based on a spin, on two spins. Mm -hmm. I can use a subspace and then I'll get entanglement. Sure, right. So I, I can take two spin halves and I can. And you can take two spin halves, you build yeah. an SU2, and you'll get the same equations and right. you can solve them the same way. And then you can check and you'll see you'll get entanglement. Mm -hmm. And then you could say this protocol is more obvious because in the spin, you can say I can always be diagonals, but when I have two spins, what you say, I change the external magnetic field, but not the coupling. You don't have control on both. So you say I have a constant coupling and I'm changing the external magnetic field. So immediately your Hamiltonian won't commute with itself at different points. In the harmonic oscillator picture though, the one that you had in the first, in the beginning, there it's harder to see how entanglement would, you know, but instead of one oscillator. Yeah, but I can, I can do, I can build my engine out of two. Right. And then I can then think. Sure, yes. Um, with one, with one, you can see the trouble about harmonic oscillator, I call it the Gaussian jail. <laughs> because if we use the algebra, it's always Gaussian states. So what you need is to generate caps. Once I generate caps, then I'm in business again. But you can do something similar with the two-mole squeeze state, I would think. It's just, uh, yeah. really, it's a bit more 
uh, complicated to see then the squeeze yeah. So, so I need some nonlinearity to break the Gaussian jail, and then I'm in business. That's how I look at it. Other questions? The last chance, of course. No, no you're not right. today. This is his last lecture. Here.